Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was uh, amazing, and I have to say it is quite humbling to be here after J.P. Bryan, after Sue Canterbury, uh, uh, Stephen Fox. Um, Randy blew me away with that, um, and I have a connection, a couple, to swing back to what Randy was talking about. And Michael is um, uh, all all his own person, and he's really remarkable. So, but it, I mean, I don't have this breadth of knowledge at all. I tend to focus uh, much more tightly on things, and we'll see a bit about that today. And I also want to tell you that not everybody's in here at all. I cut a lot of people out. I went more in depth on a few people, and um, a lot of the folks, especially the Texas Southern University people who are in my book, are not showing up in here today because I just I had too much and so I've cut back so hopefully you'll consult the book and I intend to do more work on that because I'm becoming very very avid proponent of sculpture since I've moved to the umlauf and also just pushing my thinking to it about it to a new level um, you won't be witness to that much today I just want to show a lot of pictures uh, many of you who have heard me talk over the last I don't know, a couple of years, know that I always like to come back when I'm in Houston to talking about the AFA convention that was brought to Houston in 1957. It was a huge deal because it put Houston on the international map in terms of art. It was also an interstate collaboration to get the American Federation for the Arts Conference here. You see, uh, excellent, that's Marcel Duchamp, thank you, right there. Um, so Life Magazine covered it. I was very happy, of course, to see uh, Life Magazine in Sue's presentation earlier, because let's remember it was a, a huge national magazine that everybody read and everybody would share their copies. So they covered the uh, American Federation for the Arts Convention with this article called Turnout for Art in Texas. And sculpture is major in it. And we, we have, I think, I agree with Michael wholeheartedly, kind of gotten away from the importance of sculpture in Texas art. We focus very much on paintings. Let's always remember, as, as we do when we're in the presence of these things, these outdoor public sculptures or any, anything, it's tactile. We touch it. It is like us replicated outside, whether it's abstract or whether it is figurative. It exists in our space. It's a completely different kind of thing than painting. And I think for that reason, it's been a very emotional day. Um, I think we can feel that way about sculpture, about all types of it. And all, I mean, all you have to do is put your hands on it. All you have to do is look at it and start imagining it. Um, so this is just one page reproduced. And I've just listed who the people are. And just to show how Life magazine was putting the Texans in a big context, not separating them out as if they were, you know, um, balkanized in some sense. We have images by uh, Nicholas de Stahl, Rufino Tamayo, Cezanne, Louis Aids, Ethel Broadnax, you can see some things right next door, uh, and Donald Weissman on the same page. And then there again are, you'll see this a couple of times, uh, Peggy Goldstein, David Parsons, Evelyn Sellers with somebody standing there holding it. Um, Octavio Medellin and David Cargill, all there, reproduced in Life magazine. All of the institutions got together to have exhibitions, and then Stanley Marcus helped provide airplanes to fly people around to San Antonio, Dallas, and Houston. And he also flew all of the press in so that it, he, they would make sure this would get covered. Octavio Medellin's The Dancer, which is in the Panhandle Plains Museum and is reproduced in my book. Very happy to see that there. Um, Penitentes, which is, uh, I don't actually know where the original object is, but this was uh, found for me by Sam Ratcliffe at, S at um, SMU. And El Orcado, The Hanged One, 1942. It's in the Dallas Museum of Art. That David Parsons shows up on another page, and these people are described as puzzling over the abstract cellist carved in wood by David Parsons. Two airlift visitors, airlift visitors, 
Peruse catalogs of Fort Worth Art Center sculpture show. I knew nothing about David Parsons. I, I'm just ignorant. Um, there he is featured. Uh, he was working around Rice University, very well known. Did a lot of, um, I think he was a musician and he also sculpted a lot of musical figures and there's something I was happy to found, find with the aid of the internet on him. And then that we also had a mention to David Cargill. I had the great pleasure of getting to visit his studio some years ago and uh, took some photographs from the inside, still practicing. Uh, Bill Reeves did a marvelous show that had these two works in it. That one on the left is quite large of David Cargill. And also notice this move toward abstraction. Let me grab my water. And I um, just bumped into this in a private collection, a David Cargill crucifix that um, was hanging on a wall in the hill country. Prometheus Unbound, I have not seen this, but I thought it was important to show today because of where we are and uh, a very artistic view, courtesy of Zippy the Sims head, Flickr stream, <laughs> I credit this person. But this, of course, made me think of thematic things as we saw what Michael Grauer got into, the mythology, the Greco-Roman tradition that anchors so much of sculpture and its three dimensions and the subject of Prometheus, which was actually done by Charles Umloff twice. We've, Charles Umloff does the, the proud Prometheus stealing fire uh, in his uh, hubristic moment, and then he also does the much more poignant Prometheus bound. This is a gouache on paper, and we always remember, of course, how, and Sue talked about this, Michael talked about this, we all think about this, about how all the stages in the process. So you look at the gouache on paper, and eventually, for Umlauf, it turns into this, which was a gift to us quite recently from um, some Houston people. Marjorie Jester Selden Milby, that's probably a name that's familiar to you Houstonians. Um, that was the way we worked out the labeling from the family, because it has kind of a complicated background. Umlauf's Prometheus is in, it's this big, and it is in perfect condition, never been outside, and I think part of the condition is what every, I have it up in the Umlauf house right now because I haven't placed it yet, but every time I walk by it, it just gives me a shudder because you realize that the punishment for Prometheus for stealing fire is to have his liver eaten out by an eagle, and it's not like, you know, you get used to it. The punishment is that it is new every single time. William Zorak was also in a full page spread in that Life Magazine 1957 article. And I just love this photograph because Life has quite a sense of humor. They, they certainly did with Jackson Pollock when they covered him and they do when they cover the arts because you've got these different these different types of uh, art, the William Zorak highly polished bronze that's an, you know, an art object, and then this woman's fashionable hat right in the foreground, that's another art object. But again, fluidly merging the Europeans, uh, Zorak is originally from, Russian, from Russia, and uh, merging the Europeans with the Americans and all bringing them together in elaborate exhibitions. And I have always thought that Zorak is a huge influence on Umlauf, um, not only in this one, but in, in many of the figures, uh, particularly some of those um, bronze torsos and also some of Umlauf's animals. And I was um, probably the closest parallel and, and, and partner to Charles Umlauf would be Harry Bartsch, who I'm still learning about. I was first told about him, really, um, through Tom Motley and Carl Williams, and then have slowly heard from people who have them, and you can see these right next door. That was uh, St. Sebastian. This is St. Sebastian, and this is actually called Refugees. I just gave you a shot I took last night of the top of it, but Umlauf does a whole, whole series of refugees, and I'm pretty sure that one of them is in Mark White's museum right now, so it's really fun to start putting all of these things together. And then the St. Sebastian on the right, the way that he has, that Harry Barsh has carved that wood, the piece is about this big. I know many of you have seen it. I'm not sure if we call it a cabinet sculpture <laughs> quite, but it is um, 
hor horrendously uh, visceral um, as uh, the way that the wood is carved and absolutely stunning. And I'd love to do a show putting Harry Barch and Umlauf back together as they were. They were friends. They're both, uh, Harry Barch is, of course, Umlauf is from German stock, French mother and a German father. He's born in Michigan. Harry Barsh is actually from Silesia and has a studio there before he comes to this country. And I, I put a few ads from Life in just because it tickles me about airlifting people around and then they've got this ad telling you about the newest way to fly to Paris, giving you a little hint of who they think will be reading this particular 1957 April magazine. And also, let's remember, we're talking about sculpture. Every object is a sculpture, including the new Parker 61 pen. And my dad used the Parker T-ball jotter. I still have his. It was you know, the only pen you could use. Uh, cars, of course, the finest form of art, which is certainly something that Luis Jimenez thought and felt strongly about. And I put this in for Michael Grauer because... <laughs> And that is actually a two-page spread that I somewhat art, you know, clumsily put together to try to give you the whole idea. But there is the cowboy with his, with his horse. <laughs> and um, back to this again. This, uh, some of you have seen me show this four times, and you're going to see some other things again. I'm hoping you're starting to learn them. But also in that same ish issue, we have... Um, Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong one. That's me. Uh, this is Charles, Will Charles Williams' <coughs> Battleground, then um, Virginia Oshner, Bess Hubbard, um, Harry Barch here, and Charles Umloff here. And I, this was quite enlightening to me uh, when I did an exhibition called C2 Sculptures about Charles Williams and Charles Umloff. And I, sus I found proof as w of what I suspected that. Um, Umlauf really couldn't stand Williams' art at all, and I love to see them here on the same page. There's just a, not a very good picture of Battleground, so we'll move on along from that. But um, in that Carol Morris little book, that wonderful book about outdoor sculpture in Texas that is comprehensive and shocking, it sort of reminds me of Michael Grauer's Dictionary of Texas Artists in that way. <laughs> She identifies Charles, I'm sorry, his name is left out. He's just Charles T. Um, it got cut off. Charles T. Williams, Charles Truett Williams, she identifies him as the first one to begin to bring mo a modern abstract style to outdoor public sculpture. And as we know, what happens outside also can be brought to the inside as well. Um, uh, I will barely touch on this today, but one of the things I talk about in the book and that I'm extremely interested in and would like to do more work on is the whole concept of, of primitivism, about how with modernism, as we move forward and more into the future and into the avant-garde, we also tend to go backwards into simplified forms. What does that mean? How much of it is a, is a third world going back and looking at a first world, how much is it really a kind of racism, how much is it just a formal style, and I'd love to start teasing that apart more and more. And I um, have, have thought very much that Charles Williams, who won the first place prize in the 24th Annual Texas Painting Sculpture Exhibition in 1962 with Ancient Warrior, that he was influenced by recently having seen Totem's Not Taboo exhibition here at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, because that's where um, Jerry McKeggie put it on, that he had seen this Zuni war god that was in that exhibition that was then later repatriated from the Brooklyn Museum of Art, where it had been borrowed, because these, we weren't, these weren't appropriate to have any longer. That also means they're not appropriate to reproduce photographs in a book that's academically published. So I got my dear mother, who's in the audience, thank you, Mom, to draw a killer picture of it that is reproduced in the book, just so that we could show that. It was, I, you, some people have heard me talk about that, but the, uh, the whole copyright portion was a completely separate overtime job that went on for years to try to figure these things out. And my mom knocked that out in an evening. It was fantastic. And then, um, what else happens? 
So we change materials, we become more modern with things, the, ma the materials change, the subject change. This is, of course, Charles Williams, who I, I, you know, I think is maybe one of our certainly greatest artists of mid-century and happened to be in Texas. But he drew together so much of Texas through the process of working in the studio just the same way that the whole country came together, I mean the whole country of Texas, came together in 1957 with the American Federation for the Arts Convention. It was a collaboration. So we have collaborations between dealers and museum curators and patrons and artists. And then it, it happens here among the artists learning how to make new things, how to weld, how to go to the salvage yard with Jim Love and Gene Owens went with Charlie Williams as well. And, and to go and find things and then put them together. And the other thing that you'll notice is that there's a sense of humor with these works that, that we actually have seen in some, in some work, but it's not that, that high seriousness of the classical style. We have the um, personage with a social problem here. George Washington, I think you'll recognize from the Gallery of Notables. And Moritz the Elephant, which we made a, a sticker of, and I've got it on my computer. Um, but the recycling of materials put together in new ways is a very Dada, very Picasso-esque as well, and, and relatively simple, which is something I love about these objects. This is great. Another Charles Williams, The Argument in the Fort Worth Library with somebody you probably all recognize. And this, I think you'll recognize. Um, and I don't even remember what this is called. Is it called Eight? Something like that, Eight? And it seems to be, OK, help me out here, Carl. It's, um, well, let's find out. Because I, I texted um, Carl Williams about this, and he just happens to carry his father's uh, notebook in digital form and sent it to me last night, 1115. So it's hammered steel forms, brass brazed coat. And you can tell by looking at it what it is. And then it says, to Houston International, February 1956, Accepted, I love CTW, is so precise. Accepted 6 March 1956, won only sculpture prize, $200 in show. And I'm not actually sure what show this is, so we'll, we'll talk about this, but I was just very happy to get more information. Wait, I think I have something else coming up from the bottom. Whoops. Oh, well, that's OK. That'll happen later. Um, and fun with Freud, uh, welded copper sheet. Again, new material new subject matter, um, huge, huge work. You saw that on that beginning slide for a long time. Um, incredibly huge work and then very, very delicately worked. And then we had fun with Freud at the C2 Sculptors show by putting uh, Charles Umloff torso on the visual line with it here at the Umloff Museum uh, last January. And that leads me to this gorgeous torso by Charles Umloff, much more traditional in a way. But one of the other things that Michael Grauer and, and Sue Canterbury certainly was, was trying to remind us of is how these things are made, how we care for them, what they are. And having been at the Umloff Sculpture Garden for a year and a half now, it's just astonishing how many people just come in and want to look at the statues and don't even think about the process at all. It was extremely important, um, I think, to all sculptors and to many collectors, but it was extremely important to Charles Umloff that people understood something about what they were looking at, that these things needed care. We at the Umloff have gotten a very nice private grant to care for our bronzes that we hope will be renewable, um, which is fantastic because it's always been done through volunteer basis, and now we can actually hire a professional in and ship a few things out, maybe to uh, Michael's contact, Polish guy in Chicago. And I, I took this out of the Charles Umloff book. He published it twice because it was so important in the book to explain the process of casting. We're not going to go through all of it, but it's just a, a nice, simple reminder you know, that everything starts with a, a sketch. Everything starts in the mind and then gets onto the paper somehow. And then for Umloff, because he is working in the old lost wax style, there are other styles. It's going to change. He never uses ceramic shell style. It's always the traditional 2,000-year-old style. There'll be then a terracotta model, and then he'll work up a scale model. 
and then it gets enlarged to a full size and you see here um, the inside of it here the armature of what they're working with for the enlargement and they would use old-fashioned pointing devices calipers to make this happen and he would often ship the small he started casting in Italy in with the Spirit of Flight Commission for Dallas Love Field he starts casting in Italy in 19 late 1959 to get that ready because it was just prohibitive to cast in this country he couldn't get anybody to to do Spirit of Flight which I'm not showing you for um, $56,000 and even then when it went to Italy it still went over budget but he would often send the uh, scale model over first and then the professionals at one of the foundries that he was working at and um, this is in Pietrasanta the, the guys working there who had whose parents who worked there and their parents before them had worked there um, they would then enlarge it and then Umlauf would come in and always, always, always touch up the final wax. Always. He was insistent on that. And so it's been really edifying to me to start to, I'm, I'm still learn. I'm only just now learning about Charles Umlauf, but to start to see things that were posthumously cast and maybe were a little bit less carefully made. Of course, he, you know, he wasn't there to touch it up. So another stage there are many many you know inside each step those of you who have cast bronze before know this there's about 50 different ways that it can go wrong uh, John Casson said that to me recently he's the one who did um, redid uh, Lady Liberty at the Capitol and also um, the huge star in front of the Bob Bullock Museum applying a plaster waste mold and this is something where I just wanted to take a pause and, and think about the artist Gene Owens because I'll, I'll flash by him later, but he was the first one to talk to me about this and you see it in his writing as well. Gene Owens loves that phase when a, a waste mold really is destroyed and Gene Owens always talks about casting that there's a moment when there's absolutely nothing there, when there's just emptiness there and for Gene that connects to this this Zen moment of emptiness before it gets refilled. And then the entire thing, you have to apply the pins and sprues, and then the entire wax sculpture is covered with investment material that you have, because it's wax, you have to put the wet material on first. Then the molten bronze has to be um, poured in. You actually have to take the wax out first. So he just skips that step, because if you don't take the wax out, it's going to explode. And then after the bronze cools, the investment is removed and you can see the outlines of the face coming through. And then shipping off the investment and the rods and putting the bronze pieces together. Uh, and then it all has to be welded, so a lot of times you'll see the weld marks on the final sculpture. This is a monumental sculpture, but a lot of the smaller ones are going to have weld marks on them as well. And the full scale, it was nice that we have all the documentation for Hope of Humanity because it's here at Houston at your um, Museum of Science and it's absolutely enormous, as you can see. And I, I want to say that for Umlauf, it was so important to him that people understood something about the process and I think honestly because Angie, his wife, was a bit of a businesswoman and she wanted to make sure people knew what they were paying for. That was very expensive to go through all these phases. So they, they actually wrote a very simple, this is a later, about a 1980 version, but a very simple description of all the phases that would go through for the casting process. And they actually here are describing um, St. Michael and Lucifer, which was a big commission that they, that they did a couple of times in different sizes. And so for that one, we have photographs of the clay model of um, Lucifer, the um, defeated one. They, Mike, that, you may know this from your Bible studies, but Michael wins. And then um, here's a casting of, locus, of Lotus. I found this online. You can see one that's a little bit different in uh, Russell Tether's booth over next door. Um, but this is a 1980 casting. This was originally designed in the 50s. This is a 1980 casting, and I just wanted to have a little shout out to the foundry mark here for the Pietrasanta foundry mark and to the Umlauf signature here within this one. And it's always not, not everything Umlauf has foundry marks, and we know that not every you know 
the smaller ones tend not to have them for other people either. And Umlauf did cast at Roman bronze works, by the way, a lot until he found this. Um, that's just a, something I took from the still image of Umlauf working on a monumental piece in Italy that's today in Blanco. And of course, he worked in other materials too. This is something that was in the Texas Modern Exhibition in 2007. It's in the collection of Charles Umlauf's oldest son, Carl, that I've um, done, know very well and have done quite a bit of work on. He's about to retire from Baylor. Uh, in the beginning, just to point out, many of you know this, but that Umov has a, a very strong, long-lasting primitive period, and it's just a gorgeous image. And I put, um, I'm jumping around a little bit, I cut quite a few things out and added a few things, but I wanted to make sure that we had the Richard Stout in here, because we've had a few references to Kathleen Blackshear. This is the piece that he made in Kathleen Blackshear's class at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1956. And then Richard starts casting again in the 90s at Michael Tracy's, or for, well, at least at first, at Michael Tracy's foundry in um, Mexico. And he, he doesn't have this piece anymore. He has an old slide of it. But Richard reimagines it based on several different things that he's seen and recreates it. So again, sculpture, it sort of certainly reminds me of, the, of Hogue recreating in a certain way um, his painting when he thought it was burned and how the memory plays into the recreation and then the experience of having seen new things and thinking about new things as Richard Stout was. And uh, Hannah Stewart, who I, I knew very little about until a lot of recent work was done on her. I have drive by this on the way to the hotel. I will go by. But the Atropos Key, love to talk to Sally Reynolds more. I know she couldn't be here this afternoon about uh, her talking to Hannah Stewart. Another photograph there. Back to the women again. Um, and I wanted to take a little pause to go back to Charles Umlauf. I don't want to dominate with him. I just happen to have access to a lot of great things. So um, again, back to the sketchbooks. We, we have many, about 100 of Umlauf's sketchbooks. I'm sure there were many more. But here's something that he's working on in about 1965. And he's got this new student. I just told Michael and I were talking last night, and I thought, oh, I will do a little bit about Farrah Fawcett today. So Charles Umloff has this new student in his class, and he doesn't even know how to spell her name. So he tries it. He spells it sort of like she's a, like she's a precious metal here or something, <laughs> Farrah. So he tries it out, but he starts to sketch her in class, and she does become quite amused for him. Um, just a little note, this is a, a gorgeous drawing. It just happens to have some gouache on it here. He was, he was um, going to work it up a little bit. There's actually some gouache applied here too, but I'm hoping you'll recognize who the subject is. Um, but just a little note, there's a, when Angeli Numoff uh, passed in June of 2012, all of their six children didn't get the multi-million dollar property that we're sitting on overlooking Barton Springs Road in Austin, 1.98 acres. Instead, they got um, sculpture and a life insurance policy that apparently hadn't been paid up. So they got a lot of drawings and sculpture, hundreds and hundreds of them, and they've been um, selling them over time. And they took almost all of the fairer things that they could, and I don't blame them. That was the era. And, uh, they left this behind, and I think the reason they left it behind is because of the condition. They didn't, probably didn't think that this was going to be that valuable here. They were generous with this. I don't mean to imply that they weren't, but I can just think in their decision-making process that when they saw this, it didn't look as good as some of the other Farrah Fawcett drawings, and there are uh, many, many drawings and sculptures. Another one, that's actually a reproduction of a reproduction of one uh, Afera, 1970. And uh, 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 Head Study Terracotta, that's an um, archival vintage photograph. Uh, it's uh, certainly red, it's a terracotta, but I love that photograph of her and the way he's done the shoulder, which is very characteristic of Umlauf. And then there's one on view that we have uh, in the museum, bronze, 1977. Um, they did. I'm going to do an exhibition on them because the Blanton now has Farrah's own sculptures, and I have found evidence, and 
I guess the previous curator knew this, but it wasn't passed on to me. But Pharaoh, I know, was very close with Charles and Angie Umloff and would come through Austin and see them. And when he won his Houston, uh, State Artist Award in Houston, she came and was there. And um, the Blanton has all of her sculptures. And what I learned is that he was casting for her in Italy. She would send him the plaster. I always wondered where she was casting these. And he would send them over to Milan or to Pietra Santa and cast many of them. So I want to do a little more digging on that. And there's a photograph of them that the Pietra Santa Foundry has on their website as well. We have a copy of it too. And it's kind of fun because you just see it's just a publicity shot of her working on a sculpture and him working on a sculpture of her. She's working on a torso. And we have letters from Farah too, and it's very touching. She seems like an extremely nice person. And she writes to him and says, um, talks about some of the new um, advertisements that she's doing and that she might have a chance to be in a couple of movies. And she also says, if you ever happen to have any sculptures or drawings that you don't want, please send them my way to your most admiring student. It's very sweet. Oh, and this is a little raunchy. But, I, but um, this crazy thing happened when we did the C2 Sculptors exhibition, which we featured a, a grand Farah head in it. And so the C2 Sculptors exhibition was Charles Williams paired with Charles Umloff, and it was really, really fun to do. And so, and so we sent out an email blast. Um, and somebody wrote back accidentally to us, thinking she was writing to the man she'd been sexting with the night before. And, and so she says, good morning. Again, I got back to sleep, and I hope you did too. Did I kind of sext you yesterday? That was fun. No wonder the teens do it. I lose your emails. Keep them coming. Are you interested in any of those Umlauf events? This is what prompted it. And I was too embarrassed. We, we got it at the museum. I was too embarrassed to write back and tell her, you know, misfire. But of course, I kept it. Um, she says, of course, I have taught summer classes there at the Umlauf. I know the closet where he and Farah did it. I also taught at uh, Redacted, which will be a nice visit soon with the developing, developing of the grounds happening. Let's go see it. I'll call later. Off to the senior center. <laughs> So uh, there's definitely a certain generation here. Um, so something else I, I do want to go back and trace, you know, again, not just with Umlauf, but with all of these artists. And, and, uh, but uh, Georges Min, the Belgian artist, uh, man with the water sack, and there's several copies of this around, including one at the McNay. But just look at this. Oh, well, this is, this is the same guy, in case you don't know, since that movie is quite popular right now. Um, I don't even know what's it called, um, about the Adela Blockbauer, yeah. Um, I will see it, but that's, that's George Min on either side. Originally, as they were first installed at the Vienna Secession in 1907, and then the Neue Gallery has them installed the same way. That's the artist that I'm quite sure um, was a huge influence on Umhoff, and I've found some documentation of that so far. But look at this. Um, this is Charles Umloff's disrobing that I put side by side with that water carrier that is, is definitely uh, Farah, and that sold for, I don't know, $56,000 not too long ago. The hair and the face. Just a, just a quick mention, because I, I took this photograph myself a couple of times with the figure of Eve and Farah. He only casts one eye. And that, because the other one is covered by the arm, and somehow I'm really hung up on that, that, that she only has one eye. It's not actually covered. It's not there, because there's an arm there. Um, I'll go quickly, because I think there are people behind me. Um, that is Charles Truett Williams on the left, and Gene Owens on the right. Uh, I've recently found out, should have known this, Gene Owens took a casting class in one summer with Charles Umloff, and Umloff was very generous with him. And he also learned a whole lot from Charles T. Williams, which I did know. Uh, there's a beautiful Gene Owens, The Switch. We've got totally different materials now, totally abstract. Abstract 1974 bronze. And Shiva, just giving you a hint, and I put some exhibition cards out there on the cassette table. A hint that we've got Gene Owens completely influenced by the Eastern Zen Buddhist. He worked for Noguchi for at least six different long stages 
um, and then some, versus Charles Umloff, who comes from a very Western, absolutely Western and, and um, Greco-Roman Catholic tradition, even though he's not Catholic. Um, and I didn't have anything about Jim Love, so I wanted to make sure I had something in there because I knew I was running out of time. Ed Storms and other people, another guy who worked very closely with this group, and you'll, I have a whole chapter dedicated to this, the circle around the Charles Williams group, including Ed Storms, some more from the Chiringa series, which is a, Chiringa is an aboriginal object, so again, a different tradition. Eveline Sellers, Praying Mantis. Thank you, Morris Matson has been trying to get some information to me on this, so I, didn't, I hadn't put the date on it, but he just found me right before this talk. Probably was cast in 1954. Uh, no, this one was probably cast in 93. The 1954 was in Ted Weiner's collection. And I, I know you all have seen this before, but I, I really love to compare the Giacometti woman with her throat cut, easily the most misogynistic image I've ever seen, and I, I adore Giacometti. It was cast later, but he was doing it in his ultra-surrealist phase, with Gene Owen's Parturient Machine that's now in a private collection, but I'll have that on display, and then uh, the Evelyn Seller. So I just love to put all these together, these, these animalistic uh, insects all together. I had to put a David Deming in before I left, and I wanted to close with Luis Jimenez because that's where this we started on the cover of the um, the great sculpture book that we began our talk with, uh, Man on Fire, evokes the last Aztec emperor. So again, we've got a, another tradition coming in. Um, I I hope you guys know something about Jimenez, but he was from El Paso and he was absolutely enamored of the lowrider car culture and the materials and pop culture as well which comes into all his work. There's the Vaquero in Moody Park. Here it is that I got this off of uh, Google Maps just to see how it looked exactly recently. Um, and then we showed Sodbuster San Isidro. Thank you um, to the lender who lent this to us for a long time. So there's an installation shot of Jimenez's Sodbuster. See, I squeezed, because it was designed in 78, I squeezed into the, the date for this. Jimenez was uh, fairly early. Spectacular. Everybody wondered how we got it in the umlauf door. Um, and there's a detail of it, again, bringing us back to our little art history lesson, because Jimenez writes about how he imbues the sod buster. He wants it to look like Michelangelo's god, but then he makes him a working man with the beads of sweat that here. And in the drawing for it, you've got the beads of sweat as well. And it's really interesting because this figure, I don't know how he did it, but he's sort of part Hispanic, part Western Italian god, Michelangelo god, and then he's way too old to be busting the sod. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he should be retired by now. And Jimenez managed to put it all into this single work. And I have to say, I have to tell you, I didn't have an image of it in here. I wasn't expecting it, but let's just imagine, because this is sculpture, that we could walk all the way around here and look in his back pocket. And I'll be damned if there's not a red bandana hanging out of <laughs> his back pocket. And I have a picture on my computer that I called up that I am happy to show you. I, I don't know. Well, I've got to let Randy tackle that one. But the, the, uh, my events manager at the UMOF has been very excited about that red bandana. Oh, and I want to close with this. Uh, did you know that Luis Jimenez was a Charles Umloff student? I know some of you do, because some of you came to the show. Um, Charles Umloff student, and we have the class register of from 1962 slash 1963 from the life drawing course. Jimenez comes to University of Texas, studies architecture. His dad wants him to be an architect. His dad is a, is a sign maker, a very well-off sign maker, and has done well, but he wants his son to do better than he has. So uh, Umla, but unfortunately, Jimenez, he's in there, he's in his fourth year, and he switched, switches to art, and his dad doesn't speak to him for a long time, so it caused a huge rift, but he ends up taking a class with Umla and doing pretty darn well in it. Um, here he is, and he ends up getting a B plus. And no, it is not lost on me that the only A minus is from a young woman. 
um, but then we've got Big Daddy Wade in here, Helen Yarbrough, Don Gill, um, all in here in the grade book. There's the Jimenez, and then there's that, just to make it a little bigger, I put the B plus in there. And I believe that's just to bring it back full circle, and I think I'm over time. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't cry.